Hello and welcome to this open evening for the Gillis Centre courses in Edinburgh. My name is Matt and I'd like to start by introducing our speakers who are the course leaders on the subjects on offer from St Mary's University in Twickenham. Dr Jacob Phillips will be running the Applied Catholic Theology course. Associate Professor John Lydon is running the course on Catholic School Leadership. Dr Mary Mihivalik is running three courses on education. They are Leading Innovation and Change, Pedagogy and Religious Education. Good evening all and thanks for taking part. Just so you know, this talk is being recorded. You can turn your camera off if you want and we do recommend that you watch using speaker view. Okay, here's how tonight is going to work. First of all, we're going to have a quick overview from the course leaders. They're going to tell us in just about five minutes each the practical aspects of the course benefits to students and so on. Then we're going to go to a Q&A. We want your questions. The Q&A is a great chance to speak to a course leader about anything you want to know. Uh, write your question using the chat function or when we get to the Q&A section, you can raise your hand. Myself or Marion, my tech support will look for you, invite you to unmute and you can ask your question. Please keep it brief and clear if you can. Uh, we also chat with two former students, Kevin and Louise as well as have a chat with Sister Mary Pierre Wilson, who is our Director of Properties and knows a lot about the Gillis Centre here. Then we'll return to some more of your questions before closing at 7pm. I don't know where you are, but where I am, it's very nice and warm, so we won't keep you past 7 o'clock. That's a reminder of the courses. Dr Jacob Phillips takes the Applied Catholic Theology course. Professor, Associate Professor John Lydon takes the Catholic School Leadership course and Dr Mary Mihivalik takes three MA education courses, Leading Innovation and Change, Pedagogy, Pedagogy and Religious Education. The courses begin in September and October, I should point out. They last around two years, the part-time flexible and all based at the Gillis Centre campus in Edinburgh. And of course, it goes without saying that they're open to students of all faiths and none. If you need any more information, that's the website that you want to go to. Let's get cracking. Dr. Jacob, good evening. Good evening, Matt. <laughs> good evening. Do you want to give your presentation? Yes, thanks very much. I'll just uh, share screen. Okay, so as you can see, and as Matt has said, um, the MA that I'm talking about this evening is the MA in Applied Catholic Theology. And um, <clears throat> the thinking behind this MA uh, really builds on classical theology, I suppose, in that theology is traditionally understood as speech about God or words about God, which comes from the word logos, as I'm sure some of you know, meaning word, and theos, meaning God, hence theology. But it applies that classical understanding into the contemporary world and real life situations. So we're very much uh, focused on giving people an opportunity to bring their life experience into the context of academic theology and see how to apply um, things traditionally understood to be of God or church teaching in the contemporary world. So it takes that classical understanding of theology and asks how is God speaking or how might the church be understood to be informing life today and capable of, it, of informing it more than perhaps many realise. So the official blurb is that the MA in Applied Catholic Theology is designed to provide both a thorough grounding in key aspects of Catholic theology, while also developing the necessary skills and aptitudes to apply Catholic theology to the challenges and opportunities of the contemporary world. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, there's a bit of a there's a common mis I would say a misunderstanding around often that theology because it's of such great antiquity and because in many ways it's a discipline that requires um, extremely disciplined thinking and often has to work within quite strict parameters, particularly in the Catholic world. That therefore it's a discipline that doesn't really change and talking about the challenges and opportunities of the contemporary world doesn't really make sense um, for theology. 
And I remember once um, at my parish, we got a new parish priest who um, decided that we all needed to talk to each other a bit more than we did normally. Um, so he decided to organise a, a coffee morning um, on the fourth Sunday of the month only, because obviously we could only talk to each other <laughs> uh, once a month, otherwise it might be a bit overwhelming for us. Um, <clears throat> and at the very first coffee morning, I was queuing up and the chap in the queue in front of me turned around and asked me what I did. And I said, I lecture in theology. I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a neuroscientist. And I thought, wow, OK. And he said, oh, I wish I could. Um, I wish I was I did something like theology because theology must never change. It was all sort of sorted in the 13th century and it hasn't developed since then. And he said he did one module in, in theology um, when he was at medical school in the 60s. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, he said everything he learned at medical school was redundant in neuroscience. Everything had changed. Um, but that one module he did in theology as an undergraduate was still with him 30 or 40 years later. He thought about it with the challenges that were presented to him in his work. And I thought that was a really interesting example for me of, of how theology has great stability in it, but it also can speak to many different contexts. And it's those contexts that we're particularly interested in um, with this MA. So let me talk you through the modules. Uh, the MA has, it begins with a foundational module <clears throat> on called Aspects of Biblical Interpretation where you'll be introduced to the formal or academic study of the Bible or biblical criticism, which isn't criticizing what's in the Bible, it's learning to read it critically in light of um, scholarship as that's developed over the years. From there, we move into human beings and human action in medical ethics, where you'll study the classical position in terms of understanding of, of humanity and personhood in the Catholic tradition and how these uh, pan out um, in very controversial ways often um, in the world of modern medicine. <clears throat> That's where you go, you'll go very deeply into some things which I must admit I don't understand and I'd always defer to a colleague here, um, uh, including artificial intelligence and how that's informing the medical world and all kinds of things which are going on at the moment, um, which posit certain understandings of what it means to be human, which might sit uneasily with the Catholic tradition, they might not, that will be for, for you to work out as students. From there, there's the module Foundations in Christian Spirituality, where you'll learn uh, about the great spiritual masters of the church, the religious orders, Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuits, etc., and their distinctive spiritualities, and how these things have been understood in the modern and postmodern world, and how they're understood academically. And then principles and history of Catholic social teaching is where you'll look at the, uh, the what's been codified quite recently, really, as a, as a set of social teachings, i.e. positions on politics and economics hugely topical um, stuff there. And then after that, we get into, um, uh, there's none of my colleagues here, so I can say, which is definitely the best module because it's one of mine, is systematic theology and contemporary themes um, in which you study doctrine and how the understanding of doctrine has developed, what's traditionally called systematic theology. And those contemporary themes will be um, issues in the contemporary world which have impacted on how doctrines have developed or perhaps how they need to be framed. Uh, which includes um, atheism, uh, living in a setting of religious plurality, modern technology, those sorts of things. And then after that, there is a module on spiritual direction, psychology and spiritual formation, uh, which is designed by a colleague of mine who's both uh, a professor of psychology and Christian spirituality, which looks very deeply at the, the human experience of subjectivity and how it's informed by prayer and how uh, mentorship, according to the, the Catholic tradition works, i.e. spiritual direction in that context, the history of prayer and meditation really in, in the Christian tradition. And after that, there's the dissertation where you have an opportunity to choose one of these areas you've studied or perhaps a combination of them. You get a chance to look at what really gets you going um, and do a full length piece of, of individual research, um, supervised and supported lavishly along the way by, by one of our staff. So that's a, a whistle-stop tour through the whole MA. I would say it's the sort of thing which should be open to anyone um, who's interested or engages in catechetical work, any form of parish ministry or pastoral ministry, but really anyone who's inquisitive, who's engaged with history and politics, economics, medical ethics, or even a very thoughtful and reflective person who's always wanted to understand um, more formally about, about their experience of prayer. 
you know, experience of, of um, being in the church, if you like. So it's the great thing about theology is it's still a subject which is often studied purely for its own sake, because it's something people just want to know about. Although it can inform all the many different areas of life and can certainly function as a continuing professional development for people in their, their professional life. Um, it is, as Archbishop Leo said in one of the slides that was there as you were waiting to um, enter the call, these MAs are an opportunity to grow in the knowledge and love of the faith. And not just to do that, but to find how, what rich resources there are in the world of academic theology to apply to those challenges and opportunities of the contemporary world. So it's all about how we apply these, um, these rich classical teachings to the world, which is for many very challenging but it's certainly, everyone would agree, very complex. And I think I'll leave it there, Matt. Thanks, Jacob. You never know who you're going to meet at church coffee morning, do you? No, you don't. <laughs> but I'm glad I went, and I've, I've made many good friends there on the fourth Sunday of yeah. every month, ever since. <laughs> yeah, just one question to you as I'm keen to move on. You mentioned that you, you do want theological education available to all walks of life. Is that reflected in the students who take the course regards age and background? Yes, very much so. Our, um, our taught postgraduate, i.e. our MA provision at St Mary's, always aims to be as welcoming and inclusive to as broad a range of people as possible. Um, I would say it, it wouldn't be fair to say that we have an average age because the age range we have is, is so great, actually. Um, we've just had somebody finish um, one of our MAs who is um, an octogenarian, 87, I think, and wow. um, was himself a, um, a surgeon at St George's Hospital in Tooting for many years. And right, you know, right down to an undergraduate who's just finished one of our BAs. So we have a very wide range. And in terms of the pattern of study, the delivery, as it were, um, being um, in the evening and at weekends, it's very much designed for people in work, very much designed for parents with uh, you know, childcare commitments and, and others with caring commitments. And the way in which we approach each module is done in such a way whereby we maximise flexibility wherever possible. Um, so that people get a chance to, to um, engage with theology in this way. If you want to get in touch with Jacob, his email is on the screen. Okay, if you stop sharing your screen now, and I'll move yeah. on to Dr. Mary Mahovalik. Good evening, Mary. And if you just want to unmute. There yes, go. Good, <laughs> good evening. Good evening, everybody, and delighted to meet you. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen and then we can move on. Thank you. So, um, as Matt said, I'm responsible for a number of MA education pathways. And this evening, I'm going to share with you a little bit about three of them. Leading innovation and change, which attracts um, serving and aspiring middle and senior leaders in schools and other education institutions. Um, pedagogy, which tends to attract the early career teacher and those whose focus is very much within the classroom, within their work uh, directly with children and young people. And religious education for those who are specialist or non-specialist teachers of RE uh, in primary or secondary. Uh, and of course, leaders of religious education uh, within those schools as well. So our education pathways all have the same structure, and I'll very briefly give you an overview of two of them. Uh, they have five modules and are taught through uh, a pattern, usually of something like eight intensive study days per year. Those are on Saturdays or at weekends. Uh, we have regular one-to-one -one tutorials at a time that suits our busy practicing professional students. So usually evenings, uh, and Saturdays, and those are probably twice uh, a term. We have keynote lectures and workshops that we, um, we live stream, um, where we bring in national and international experts, or we focus on things like research ethics or academic writing, and those take place on Saturdays, and they are uh, optional extras, if you like. And we have an annual research conference at which our students present the outcomes of their research because at the heart of our degrees is a small scale research inquiry into an act, uh, uh, you know, an aspect of practice, the student's own practice, or those perhaps more widely of the school. 
and that might include things to do directly with perhaps the provision of a particular curriculum area. It might be to do with aspects of the Catholic life of the school, of retention or recruitment of staff, um, or something just that's a very real and pressing issue. So at the moment, some of our students are looking at things like trauma-informed practice post-COVID, um, children's well-being, staff well-being, and a number of other issues, um, racial equality in education, things that are very current and current challenges to us. I'm going to very briefly outline for you Leading Innovation and Change, or LEAC. This is a very long-standing and popular programme. In year one, students take two modules, the first one being leadership and professional attributes, and then after Christmas, moving to design their research proposal to a module on research design. I'll come back in a moment to what the red um, acronym there, APL, stands for. At the end then of year one, students move into year two. There are 180 credits to a master's. And in year two, they will choose an option module. I'll give you a moment to see the wide range of options there available for our students. And then moving on to the second semester, we study change theory and we support our students through their research um, to the point where they can make an evidence-based case for change, for innovation, for policy in their own context. So making a real difference to the children and colleagues and young people they serve. And then finishing with a 10 to 12,000 word dissertation an academic paper and making a presentation at conference. And that really is sharing the outcomes of the research. I'll very quickly just give you an overview of the religious education pathway. The first module here in year one, I'm sorry, that's an error that shouldn't, that I'm moving then into year two. Um, the first module then looking at develops and developments in religious education, current changes and developments. So, um, that might be in terms of the church's uh, understanding of religious education. It might be about um, government change, challenges to religious education or whatever. Moving on then to the same research design module to work up a research proposal to look at an aspect or aspects of religious education. And then moving into another module of challenges in religious education, you know, in the light of the research and the work that's been done so far, um, drilling down really very deeply into some of those issues, both theological and pedagogical, in terms of uh, religious education in the 21st century. Moving on then to the change module and, um, you know, building a case for change and development in RE and then the dissertation. The red uh, acronym there, APL, uh, is accreditation of prior learning. And just to say very briefly, that we uh, recognise as prior learning M-level credits, which map closely to the learning outcomes of our programme. So it is the case that um, those um, achieved in a PG cert, a postgraduate certificate or diploma in education, uh, a PGCE or a professional learning programme, perhaps a, a government one, maybe a secular one or a church one, um, could be accredited at M level and we accept up to 90 credits. Those are very much um, individual. And so we would encourage you to contact us to just talk about them and, and explore with us whether they would be recognized. And finally, to let the students speak, we I think we'll be making these uh, slides available. I'll just draw your attention perhaps to the, the third one of these. Um, where this student is very appreciative of the benefit of the benefits of the structure, completing a part-time course for people who, like Joe's, um, Jacob said, are very busy with other commitments, and building upon uh, skills, knowledge, and engaging in research. But also, what really delights us time and again is how such study reignites students' passion for learning and actually for progression to school leadership within our schools, um, and in many cases to doctoral work as well. So our programmes are very much inclusive. They are um, studied by students and uh, 
leaders in Catholic schools and in other contexts. They're also uh, very popular with both Catholic and non-Catholic teachers and practitioners in our schools who perhaps uh, want to uh, look a little bit uh, at some other uh, possibilities career-wise or who want to look through a Catholic lens at the practice in their schools. Do please contact us if you've got any queries at all. And I'll just finish with proof, really, that students come out the other end. Um, and as I, I have to say, always look fantastic and, and, and really very relaxed by the time they get to graduation. Thanks, Mary. I remember being miffed at my graduation for not, with not getting a cap. I had the gown, but I didn't get the cap. I just didn't, didn't feel like I graduated properly. <laughs> We're going to move on swiftly because time's marching on to Dr. Um, sorry, Associate Professor John Leiden, who is taking the MA in Catholic School Leadership. Do you want to unmute, John, and begin your re-presentation? Thank you. And, um, good evening, colleagues, and um, welcome to this um, Gillis um, Centre Open Evening. May I first thank Ma um, Matt for his tremendous um, support um, in the process of setting up this open evening. Um, I'll show these um, slides fully. So as we've said, a taught MA Catholic School Leadership Principles and Practice. So a brief overview then, a long established program um, since 1997. And um, yeah, as you can see there, um, several, um, an enormous number of students since have been promoted to significant um, positions of leadership in the schools and, uh, you know, but right across, middle, senior, etc. Headship, executive headship. So taught structure modules, I'll come to those a little later on. And the fact that we bridge education and theology makes it a unique and the only such programme in the UK. So delivered in full-time, part-time modes. And we have, and this is particularly significant in the context of the Gillis Centre, outreach centres in London, Manchester, and Derry. And typical sales pitch, one of the most reasonably priced MAs on the market. Like Mary's slide there, that's the full slide 2019, as you see there, and you can see colleagues from a range of backgrounds. The bishop in the front there is um, the Bishop of Derry, a flourishing centre of ours, which I'll refer to again. So we really aim to, um, in the programme with the, um, the other colleagues and myself, to model this service that Pope Francis speaks about. So that, an overarching aim then, to provide a programme, as you see there, that integrates Catholic philosophy of education with the principles and practices of effective leadership. The course content, we simply have four core modules, and you can um, see them there. Um, and what I'd say there is they reflect a holistic perspective, maintaining a balance, as I um, often say, between school improvement issues and Catholic distinctiveness and the integral link between the two. And Matt was going to provide this um, PowerPoint later on, as Mary pointed out earlier. Therefore, I'll um, just shoot the slides very quickly and you can read about it later on. Four. And following the completion of the four modules, colleagues engage in um, dissertations, 15,000 words, um, following a kind of intensive course around research methods. And the two um, favorite topics of last year were centered around the primacy of the Catholic Church's mission to the poor and the nature of mission integrity, what that actually means. And this is, um, you know, classical um, 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 modes of um, um, presentation, if you like. But I think the latter, the online forum, is particularly significant. And uh, 
This contributes to 20% of the marks for each assignment. And um, you'll see in some of the um, um, testimonies later on that students regard this as particularly invaluable in sharing ideas and concepts around the leadership of Catholic schools. And indeed, there are no exams, which should be a great bonus to everybody. And Moodle is our virtual learning environment. And I'll say this at this point, um, one of the key uh, um, advantages we have is that we have an extensive range of materials on this site. And um, so co colleagues are really appreciative of that as opposed to having to go to libraries. And this is very, very relevant to our centre in Derry, which like Gillis, a long way away from our site in St Mary's, but they're able to access all these materials online, alongside, of course, the range of um, e-books, which are taking on a particularly um, important feature of our library provision. What do, um, colleagues have said briefly, and, to, and we've got two colleagues who've um, experienced our program on screen tonight. So very briefly then, particularly spiritual dimension. I'm, I, I think that's particularly important. This particular colleague, an executive head teacher in a, in a very, very large school in, in a London, describes Saturday schools as mini retreats. You'd expect every course, I guess, to be accessible. And we're um, no exception to that. But all the materials are there when it is needed compared to other courses I have studied at other universities. We were particularly kind of taken by that. Um, and, she, and this particular colleague claims she always comes away with something new and she'd studied at two other universities. And the course units have allowed me to reflect on my own sense of leadership and being a role model in Catholic education and trying to roll the model as you two do. And the two are my um, two colleagues on this program. Very briefly, Professor Grace, um, very well known, speaks of the program in this way. And he wouldn't have said this if he didn't believe it. Quality teaching and highly professional tutorial guidance. Mary's mentioned this so very briefly, um, accredited prior learning, national professional qualifications related to the aims of our program. And I was looking at the Scottish equivalents today. So um, not many, but some of our colleagues have already completed master's degrees and accredited prior learning, as Mary said, assessed on a case by case basis. I'd say at this point that um, in terms of um, progression um, in study, we have a significant number of colleagues who engage this program and we're now completing PhDs with us. And um, I think it's upwards of 10 between the three of us. And um, we're very happy about that. The colleagues want to develop what they um, presented in the masters, um, their masters dissertations going a stage further. And you can see there another comment from Professor Grace. And finally, to authenticate the program, I have indeed met the Pope. Matt, thank you very much. That's photoshopped. Fun. That's, <laughs> that's a lovely picture. And no wonder thank people you. are saying get some such good feedback from the students when you don't have an exam. That's, I've been yes. saying that as well, but there's a dissertation, so yes. I don't think you're getting away with it, everyone. Uh, yeah, just, that's right indeed. <laughs> if you stop sharing your screen, John, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time maybe just for one question, John. Uh, I just want to ask what the two, if there's two particular positive features from the programme in the mind of students. Thank you very much, Matt. Well, there is a broad range of evidence, as I say, and I've shown some of it, that the students receive outstanding tutorial support. And you saw there from one of yeah. them, several students claimed that um, the tutors model the concepts they share. And this is all seen in student evaluations. Um, which also highlight the range of online specialist resources, which is, um, you know, kind of particularly significant, particularly if you're in, in, in Derry, and St. Mary's is in Twickenham. Mm -hmm. And uh, Derry's, um, the course at Derry has gone from strength to strength, and we've maintained, um, you know, kind of 
good numbers. Thank you. Yeah. Edinburgh is going to blow dead out of the water. Trust oh, me. Oh, good. That's what, that's what we're hoping. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> good stuff. Let's go to the Q&A now. Some of you have put questions in the chat, but you can raise your hand uh, and come off camera if you want. Come onto the camera if you want to ask a question that way. So I'll just snip into the chat now. Um, <laughs> someone's unable, unable to stay because the, the League Brownies and have a meeting that's due to start on Zoom. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Sharon Smith asks, does APL apply to Applied Catholic Theology course? What is APL for people who don't know, like me? Uh, accredited Prior Learning, I believe. Right. Sorry, was that, that, that was for the MA, Applied Catholic Theology, was it? Yes, Sorry, yeah, yeah. Interrupt. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so um, it, it's applying uh, credits for courses which have been studied elsewhere in order to, um, to join uh, a course at St Mary's. And the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, drop me an email and I will um, uh, liaise with our admissions people uh, to be as accommodating as possible for any APL opportunities. Uh, Sharon also asked, what is the duration of course of part-time? But I think I can answer that. Am I right in saying it's over two years? That's correct, yes. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, I live in Edinburgh, asks Martin Castles. Can I confirm that the courses, my own interest is the Emmy in Applied Catholic Theology, Jacob, you're winning, will be real rather than virtual unless it is legally impossible to do so? The answer is yes. Um, if, if it's at all possible legally, and we're assuming it will be by September, we're very much hoping it will be, um, mm. face to face will be the primary mode of delivery. We will be as flexible as possible, and we have got used to delivering classes face-to-face um, -face with a student or two, or sometimes more, um, <clears throat> joining us on Zoom. We appreciate that some prospective students um, might have very good reason. We don't know what will happen with the pandemic, and there might be some that have very good reason not to want to travel. Mm -hmm. um, and we have many such students on our courses at St Mary's. Um, so we might do both, but for those who want to do face-to-face, -face, provided we're allowed to by the government, that will absolutely be the primary mode of delivery. And I think I can say, I think it's fair to say anecdotally, I think St Mary's has, um, <clears throat> has, has maintained, I think on average, more face-to-face -face than most institutions. I think it's fair to say mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're quite pro face-to-face. -face. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think that's probably a question that my colleagues might want to comment on with their particular situations as well, I'm not sure. Mary first. Yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly we have uh, been doing a dual mode delivery for some years now, whereby we have our students on campus and we have others joining us online. Our plans for the Gillis Centre would be that we would teach on site there, um, but offer that opportunity to others who perhaps for whatever reason couldn't attend. And that might be snow in the winter or one of those things mm -hmm. that you get perhaps more of than us. Um, but also it allows us to, um, you know, ensure the teaching and our uh, teaching via Zoom is exactly the same in terms of the activities that we engage with. And um, Matthew, um, I'll not repeat anything of, uh, that Mary has said, that uh, um, simply applies to us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sean asks, what is the cost? Now, obviously these things do cost money, there's no getting around it, but there is match funding. I don't know if either can get into that or maybe Marion can pop in on that, I don't know. There is, um, there is a matched funding bursary scheme. So if your parish in the Diocese of St Andrews in Edinburgh is willing to pay £500 in terms of bursary, that will also be matched by St Mary's. Thanks. Further if you, that can be found on the website. Yeah, stmarys.ac.uk forward slash Edinburgh. Of course, information, the exact prices are all up there as well. Okay. So I don't know if there's any other questions at the moment. Oh, we've got one from a guy, sorry, a woman, Eliza Beach asks, I graduated in Poland. Who is the best person to speak to about recognition of my credits slash degree? Shall I? I would suggest um, contacting the uh, programme lead who's here this evening. Yeah. But it will, and, and registry has a very um, efficient process for looking at the equivalence of degrees from different countries. Yeah. So that yeah. should be quite straightforward. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Mary. OK, we're halfway through, so let's, well, just over halfway through, so let's take a wee breather. We've not heard from Archbishop Leo Cushley. He's not here, but we've got a promo video featuring him and the Vice-Chancellor, Anthony McLaren, 
mm-hmm. and it lasts about three minutes and I'm going to share it now. So if you don't like promo videos, go and make yourself a cup of tea. St Mary's University has long been a beacon of excellence in Catholic education. The Archdiocese too has always sought to promote catechesis and Catholic education as part of its key aims. Our partnership with St Mary's will therefore create an invaluable addition to the church in Scotland, invaluable above all for what it can offer to our lay Catholic men and women. For over a century and a half, the Gillis Centre was home to St Margaret's Convent and School and more briefly to the Senior Seminary of the Archdiocese. It is, I believe, a cause of great rejoicing that this site will soon resume a prominent role in the provision and advancement of Catholic education in Scotland. The arrangement that we have made with St Mary's will provide invaluable means for Catholics to grow in the knowledge and love of their faith. In this way, we are also responding to the Holy Father's call to invest in the intellectual formation of the laity and the evangelization of professional and intellectual life. As Vice Chancellor of St Mary's University, I'm delighted that we have the opportunity to bring a range of theology and education postgraduate courses to the Gillis Centre in this unique partnership with the Archdiocese of St Andrews and Edinburgh. St Mary's has a long and proud history in Catholic education. We were founded in 1850 to train Catholic school teachers to go out and teach in disadvantaged communities. This tradition stays with us today through our distinctive Catholic identity, seeking to develop the whole person and empower our community to have a positive impact on the world. As a university, we follow our guiding principles of excellence, generosity of spirit, respect and inclusiveness, putting the student experience in the heart of all we do. I hope you are able to join us on one of our courses soon. Okay, I'd like to bring in and spotlight two former students to give a wee testimony of what their experience was like at St Mary's. They are Kevin Quinn and Louise Elliott. Good evening to you both. Good evening. Hi Louise. Okay, can you tell us first of all Louise, uh, where you teach and what you teach? To St Andrews High School in Coatbridge. I spend half my time teaching business education and the other half religious education. Kevin. Yeah, I, I teach at St Andrews Secondary School in, in Glasgow. I'm currently one of the deputy heads at the school. I also do some teaching as well. I teach ICT and some RE. Kevin, tell us how you decided to take a, a course at St Mary's and what you were doing at the time. Um, as you can tell from my video picture, I, I'm a wee bit long in the tooth as a teacher, so I've been teaching over 25 years, and through that, I, I've engaged in a, a number of courses. So the last course that I participated in was a, a standard for headship within within uh, Scotland, um, and having completed that, I, I was aware that I wasn't going to just stop there as as, as a teacher. And, and learning, and so I found online that, that St Mary's were involved in providing Catholic leadership courses, um, which I have a particular interest in within my own school. So that, that kind of started the ball rolling for me. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not a former student, I'm actually a student just now, so I'm currently, oh. I, I'm still currently uh, in the process of completing uh, the Masters. Um, however, uh, it's probably been one of the best 
pieces of CPD that I've, I've, I've been involved in, uh, and I'm grateful. Uh, I know uh, uh, Professor John Lydon's on our um, presentation this evening. I'm, I'm grateful for John and, and all the uh, colleagues who, who, who work with him uh, and the support that they've given me during that particular time. Uh, Kevin talks about support there, Louise. Is that your experience getting quite a lot of support when you studied at St Mary's? And you're not a current student, are you? No, no, I, I finished um, last year. But yes, the, the support for me was was outstanding. It was above and beyond what I could have expected. Um, I came in as a, a new teacher in my NQT year. Um, and I was looking to, I had 15 years uh, industry experience beforehand and I was really looking for something that was going to bridge that gap and get me settled in as a teacher quite quickly. Um, so I had a lot, of, a lot of work to do, it was an uphill climb and there was loads of support there, lots of flexibility and I managed to do it. Yeah. Anytime I'm thinking of taking a course or anything like that, I think, is it hard? So obviously it's going to be challenging, but Louise first, is it difficult? Um, not particularly. I didn't. I didn't have any struggles with it. Um, as a as a teacher uh, and as a mum, you don't have a lot of time for yourself. I found that by taking part in this course, I was putting myself in my own base development first and prioritising myself for the first time in a long time. I think that maybe helped uh, minimise any stress that I felt from the workload because I, I certainly didn't feel that I was under pressure at any time. Karen, do you find it easy? <laughs> I wish I did find it easy. Um, I, I, I think the best way to describe it is I find it incredibly interesting um, and such a change in a focus for, for myself as a senior leader within a school. So to a certain extent, my, my journey to uh, the course through Catholic leadership was about a, a kind of um, issue that I would have within, within Catholic schools about a kind of systematic approach, which is about figures and league tables and things like that. And for me, I wanted for myself, but I also wanted for my colleagues to to, to bring us back to what I think it was the core, uh, the core mission within our school, which was about why are we here and, and what do we want to do for young people. Uh, so from that perspective, I, I wouldn't say it was difficult. Um, there are challenges to it. I certainly wouldn't shy away from those, but yeah. um, it, it has really, really focused me in my my own faith journey, but also continuing in my own leadership journey within a Catholic school, uh, and has kind of grounded me a wee bit more in, in what the things are that I think are important within a Catholic school, uh, and not what my maybe the local authority tell me are the things that are important within a Catholic school. <laughs> I hope that's not been broadcast to Glasgow City Council. Uh, final question for you both is, what advice would you give anyone here who's, you know, think about taking a course to take the leap, Louise? Um, I would reassure them that, you know, it's completely flexible and you can take it at your own pace, that there is loads of support there from personable, really kind uh professors and tutors with lots of empathy for you and your, you know, your teaching commitments. And I would just encourage as many people as possible to, to go for it because it's a, it's a really enjoyable experience. Go for it. Is that something you'd agree with, Kevin? Yeah, I, I think probably the, the colleagues who are on just, just uh, this evening have a, a, a number of uh, queries about, about the course. I, I, I probably uh, echo what Louise said. The, the support that you get is second to none uh, in relation to just either through emails, phone calls. Uh, the resources are there uh, at, at the drop of a hat. I, I know some other colleagues have, have spoke about uh, funding for it. You, you know, I, I think where there's a will, there's a way, and you can work around that. Uh, I think there are plenty of opportunities and plenty of um, areas in which you can access funds to, to help in the cost of, of the course. But certainly it's it's a it's a course for me that I have thoroughly enjoyed. I'm enjoying still, uh, even in the current situation uh, that we would have in secondary schools. Um, so yeah, absolutely go for it. Uh, and I don't think you'll regret doing it. Kevin and Louise, thanks very much for joining us. Okay, our next guest is Sister Mary Pierre Wilson. She is a director of properties here at the Gillis Centre. That's the Gillis Centre behind me, and that's 
where I am in, right now in the office, and she's usually next door to me. Uh, and she's the religious sister of Mercy of Alma in Michigan as well. Good evening, sister. Good evening, Matt. Thank you for inviting me. What is the Gillis Center? Well, that's a good question. The, the Gillis Center is uh, very special in the hearts of many people in the church, especially in the Edinburgh area and wider, because as you can see over Matt's left shoulder, uh, the beautiful chapel that's there, uh, the building has great history. The oldest part, which is now over his left shoulder, behind his head now, <laughs> uh, goes back to the 15th century. There was a house there. And then especially in the early 1800s, it was built on and they built the school, which is that center section off to the left. And then it was extended on. Um, but this was the uh, Bishop Gillis, for whom the center is named, uh, founded the first convent in Scotland after the Reformation, over 300 years with no religious in Scotland. And then one of the first schools that for Catholic children. Um, so there's just a tremendous amount of history there. Most of the buildings you see in there were from the 1830s, 1840s. So it's named after Bishop Gillis. That's correct. Bishop James Gillis uh, was from the north of Scotland, although born in Montreal and fluent in French, but he uh, moved back with his family when he was a teenager and then went to the seminary. He was bishop here from 1837 to 1864 when he died and he founded all of that and there was a, a wealthy businessman John Mengus who funded a lot of these projects and it's very special that the two of them are actually buried in the crypt of the chapel there. Yeah what is, is there anything special about the building? Well, the chapel is A-listed. It's got uh, a number of famous architects helped design the school and the chapel, especially James Gillespie Graham, Archibald McPherson, Edward Welby Pugin, Augustus Welby Pugin. Uh, so there's just some beautiful parts of the building and a lot of history. Besides Bishop Gillis and John Mengus in the crypt, there are also a number of members of the Hope Scott family, which is the branch of Sir Walter Scott's family that came into the Catholic Church through the ministry of St. John Newman. And several of them are buried in the crypt as well. So it's very rich in history. And I actually took this picture today outside. It's, it's, it's a, it a lovely day, so you know we can lounge about on the grass if it's a day like this as well. It's not haunted, is it, sister? I'm in here myself and I've got to lock up tonight. Uh, well, there have been stories that there's uh, a, a sister or two that occasionally roam the halls at night, but uh, nothing proven. <laughs> sister, thanks very much for joining us. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay, if you want to ask a question, we've got just uh, over 10 minutes left. Um, I'm going to just search on the chat section now, unless you can raise your hand if you want. Sorry, Nancy, I thought you were raising your hand, but I think you're just doing something like that. Hold on, I'll get everyone up. Okay, I'll go to the chat section. Is matching fund is match funding? Mary Glenn asks. The same for another diocese. I think she's from Motherwell Diocese, and I don't think we've got good news for her. No, I think it's only for the Diocese of St Andrews and Edinburgh, unfortunately. You know where to move to. Uh, oh yeah, Andrew Casty wants to ask a question. So if we can unmute Andrew, please. Hi, Andrew. May, it may be a little bit more complicated. So I, I'm from Living Motherwell Diocese, but I work um, as a pastoral associate for the Sacred Heart Church in Edinburgh. And I wondered about the match funding. My workplace is Edinburgh, but I live in Motherwell. And mm. the, the Jesuits are going to pay for me. So it was just to um, get an idea on that. It may be a bit more complicated. You might have to check that out. I think we can wangle something for you, but does anyone with more knowledge than me know anything about that. I don't know if Marion. If your parish is, you know, you work in a parish, it doesn't it seems reasonable that you can expect some match funding. I'd imagine that if it's a parish within the archdiocese, that would be the case. But if you just email through to the one of the I will do. That's right. yeah. directs, and then get back to you directly with that question. No problem. That's fine. Uh, Marion, if just in the last 10 minutes we want to spotlight the three speakers on myself and we'll get everyone up and I'll look at a couple more questions. Nancy, reveal 
asks, and if I can ask the speakers all to unmute so you're ready to speak, our lecture is recorded if I can't watch at a time it is held. Jacob. Yes, we do that as standard at St Mary's now. Um, <clears throat> and we did that, it started just before the pandemic broke, actually. We, we introduced what we were calling um, teaching and learning capture or TLC back then, if anyone, if even my colleagues remember that nomenclature, which got swamped by COVID. But yes, we do. Um, myself, in, in my own lectures, I <clears throat> tend to use Zoom and upload a link to our um, virtual learning environment, Moodle, which um, Dr. Lydon mentioned. Yeah. But that, yeah, that's, that's standard practice. Okay, and Nancy also asks, is uh, applied Catholic theology, so you again, Jacob, is, what's the length of the dissertation and is there other submitted work? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the dissertation is 15,000 words, but don't be put off by that. You have lots of time and lots of mentoring and lots of stewardship. Uh, and you'll actually find nine times out of 10, most people find it's not enough words once they get going, believe it or not. And the last stages of submitting a dissertation are nearly always removing things, um, although that might seem shocking at this stage. Um, and it's absolutely the case that there is um, assessment on each of those modules I mentioned. There are two um, assessments. One we normally do about halfway through and another one towards the end of each module. There is a range of assessments. Um, I'd say we still overall prioritise the traditional essay on the on this um, MA, but there are more um, occasional forms of assessment such as case studies, book reviews, presentations and things like that to give more of a practical element um, and to mix it up a bit. We also try and do a bit of what we call formative assessment where there's um, uh, a, a much less burdensome small piece of work or a small task which people can get feedback on prior to doing a formal assessment so they get a bit of a dry run as it were um, but in saying all this I must say these this, this MA is, is very much designed assuming that a good number of the students present won't have done any academic study for a few years so we do ease you in gently and we do spend um, quite a bit of time um, outlining what's required, especially with the early assessments and, and going over people's suggestions about how to approach them and that sort of thing. We do try and make sure that nobody's just given a deadline and left to sink or swim. Okay. I'll ask all of you, um, what are the, the eligibility requirements, Mary? If you just want to unmute, please. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Do you mind saying it? What are the, uh, I suppose, the eligibility requirements? What I mean is, do I have to have a degree to take the course or I've been away for 20 years? OK, so uh, usually we are, our, our standard admission criteria uh, is that uh, our students will have a, um, a good honours degree. By that we mean a 2-2 or above or equivalent um, and have either a professional interest or professional experience in education. There are exceptions. So there are those perhaps who don't have that degree for whatever reason or have perhaps studied in, uh, and have a degree that's not recognised. Um, then we will then interview and we will make an assessment uh, at that stage. OK, um, Carol Chamberlain asks, oh, sorry, John, jump in if you want to unmute. Keyword unmute, please. Um, just to um, emphasise what Mary was saying there, Yes, um, standard two to um, and upwards, but four or five of our students over time have had an equivalence um, to, uh, to a degree um, and we um, agreed to take them on board and they were very, very successful. So again, this flexibility would have to be negotiated, etc. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you remind us, Jacob, how the duration of the uh, theology course? Yeah, so it's two years. Um, May I just also just add something about the MA Applied Catholic Theology, the entry requirement. So it's the same, it's the St Mary's policy that people are normally expected to have a BA and a 2-2 two -two, um, two -two or yeah. above. Um, but we, um, I really have, would want to highlight um, how much sufficient work or volunteering experience um, will be looked at very attentively for, for people that might not fulfil those entry requirements for this MA. And it's also in the, um, it's been put into the paperwork for this degree that there's a certificate and catechesis run by the archdiocese and that students who have completed that certificate um, would also normally be considered, one would expect to have the sufficient um, work or volunteering experience on a case by case basis. So um, I wouldn't want anyone to be put off um, by the, 
the expectation of a 2-2 without having spoken to me about their particular case. Okay, I just want to get up the, if you bear with me, the courses again, just so people can see, I have to share my screen. Is it, uh, one thing that confused me is that I suppose the Catholic theology course at the top there is almost different from the rest because the four underneath it are for teachers, is that right? Um, John? Yeah, thank you. Um, our course, uh, primarily, um, we um, have teachers engaging on the programme, but Matt, also, we have governors, we have several governors uh, who've um, engaged, business, school business managers, and um, chaplains have indeed um, um, got embarked upon a programme as well. So it's not simply teachers. So, um, and of course, we've got a couple of chief executive officers, as we say down here, of multi-academy trusts who've engaged the programme as well. Thank you. Would you agree with that, Mary, for yourself, for your course? Yes, very much so. Uh, and also um, uh, diocesan officers too, and yeah. diocesan advisors, uh, yeah. particularly on the RE programme. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Good point. I'm just going through the chat again, just to make sure there's anything there. Someone said I might have missed a question. So, you know, you can still raise your hand if you want to any, ask any final questions. But of course, you can also get in touch with the guys. We'll put up their email details uh, towards the end. Um, it's 18.56. The weather outside is rather clement here in Edinburgh. I don't know where it is where you are, but I'm not going to keep you for, <laughs> keep you for too long. So hold on a second. For some reason, I've stopped my video. I'm back on. Uh, so I'm just going to summarise now and I'll just share my screen again. The sign of an amateur is when they say they're going to share their screen and then they share your screen. That's why I am. So that's the courses. And that's the website that you need to go to. It's just left for me to say thanks to Jacob, Mary and John. A special thanks to our guests, Kevin and Louise and sister Mary Pierre for joining us as well. Marion for all her help and keeping me right and making this event happen. And also to you for joining us. We do hope you found it beneficial. Um, that's the emails that you need if you want to get in touch. I'm sorry if I missed your question in the chat. I'm trying to do two things at once there. So take a photo of that or screenshot it or something or visit the website stmarys.ac.uk forward slash Edinburgh. Sister Mary Pierre, would you like to finish this meeting with a prayer, please? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of exploring the riches of Catholic education. May those who teach and those who study each grow in their knowledge of you and of themselves. Bless each person who took the time to participate and let this time bear fruit in each of our lives. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.